Good morning, everyone. Um, this is, uh, you know, I think a panel that couldn't be more relevant, couldn't be more timely. Um, investing in growth opportunities in developing markets. Um, uh, the Economist, I think we share the view of a, a lot of uh, commentators that this growth of emerging markets is going to be the big long-term story of the first half of the 21st century and that the rise of the global middle class, the rise of prosperity uh, for all sorts of people that were previously outside of that, uh, the good life, is going to be a great story. But it's clearly, you know, as, as you see on the chart up on, uh, over there, that we have this, uh, the 2008, roughly, were, with a financial crash, depending on what you think about purchasing power parity as a proper way of doing these things. Um, I'm sure the Big Mac index would give a slightly different measure. But nonetheless, at that point, around 2008, was when the uh, emerging market started to overtake uh, the developed markets in the share of global GDP. And basically, it looks like a straight line in both directions. Uh, for the uh, foreseeable future, if you take that as inevitable. Um, yeah, in the last year or two, um, we've started to see, you know, I think a more nuanced story about emerging markets and particularly about investing in emerging markets, where we have seen the, the, the BRICS, uh, you know, go wrong in all sorts of individually different ways. Um, you know, Brazil corruption and oil price exposure and just a general loss of momentum there. Russia, not only the commodity prices, but also a sort of uh, a world leader gone uh, aggressive and, and causing all sorts of uh, self-inflicted wounds through um, sanctions and so forth being the result of his overseas exertions. Um, India was in a really bad way, seems to have elected a really a promising leader, but nonetheless, uh, can he deliver through Parliament that's famously slow moving the kind of uh, reforms that he clearly wants to introduce? And then China, which seemed to be uh, sort of bulletproof in a way uh, to the global economic trends, also seems to be entering a period of, you know, what is clearly going to be transition, it's going to be difficult transition, and the great concern that we're everyone is having at the moment is how, how much of a drag on economic growth is the really fundamental transition going on in its economy actually going to have. Um, and we also have this uh, sort of lurking um, concern about the Federal Reserve and what the implications of a higher interest rate environment will be. Um, you know, if the Fed ever gets around to raising interest rates, which is, is a moot point at the moment. But nonetheless, um, when it even talked about tapering off uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a rush of money out of the emerging markets. And the question is, if we really did have a shift uh, in, in Fed policy, would that be a more substantial reaction? So, um, and then, you know, maybe a, a, some, some parts of the world where there are brighter stories to be told. Uh, you know, most notably Africa, where um, you know, I was in Lagos earlier this year and it was very gloomy. But then we had the, and there was a lot of talk about would there be a civil war if the election was very uh, tightly contested. And in fact, we've seen a peaceful transition um, in Nigeria in a sense that maybe that will be a significant turning point. We're going to hear a bit more about that in a bit. So this is a very interesting period. And what I want to do is ask each of our speakers to start with their assessment of really what is the next five-year outlook for them. Does, does it feel like, you know, I think all of them will say positive long-term things about the emerging markets, but what's, the, what's this near to medium-term outlook for the next five years? And I want to start, um, we actually unfortunately had a last-minute dropout from the, the advertised panel that John Powers couldn't make it here this morning, but we're really, del really delighted that Mark Kutis has been able to step in at short notice, and thanks, Mark who is Chief Investment Officer for Special Situations at the Abu Dhabi Investment Council, and so brings the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund long-term perspective to play. But Mark, I wanted to start by asking you for your you know, highlights of what you're most worried about, optimistic about. You know, how, does the, how does the emerging market story look to you over the next five years? Thank you. <clears throat> I think I, I would agree that on a longer-term horizon, we're very constructive on emerging markets for all the obvious reasons. 
and, and particularly if you attend the Milken Conference and you know you, you get an opportunity to think about the broader issues in terms of improvement in healthcare, uh, bringing in a lot of populations like in Africa and other places in, into the global uh, workforce. But over the next five years, I think we're going to have a very turbulent time. And clearly, you, ha you have a very peculiar situation where the so-called risk-free rate is zero, which has caused a lot of distortions in the markets. So if you are any kind of institutional, or for that matter, if you're a private investor and you are looking, realistically looking forward on a five-year horizon, you must be thinking about single digit returns. So that's the first thing. So you're going to probably get, even if you're a 50-50, sort of 50 debt, 50 equity, and debt is at two, and the long-term returns for equities at seven. So no matter how you slice it or dice it, thinking about uh, double digit returns on a five-year horizon is going to be very difficult. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you try to abstract from this conversation and say, oh, I'm going to look for high growth rate economies and I'm going to invest there. Well, we all know that correlation is very tenuous. And you know, China is a classic example that it grew at phenomenally high rates for a long time, but the stock market didn't do well. The third thing you have to consider, particularly if you're a US-based investor or a dollar-based investor, is we're probably in an environment where the dollar will be strong. And it's not because everything is great, but it's just because other countries around the world are looking at uh, in, you know, implementing quantitative easing type strategies. So at a bare minimum, I would say you should be thinking about, as a US investor, you should be thinking about hedging, hedging your portfolio. I'm not saying not investing, but if you invest overseas, you should be hedging your portfolio. And the last thing you should be asking yourself is, well, what am I doing? Should I be in the public or the private markets? <clears throat> and that's a much more complex question. So. Going forward, lower, re lower returns and, and, and more volatility. Now, if you ask me for specifics, I would say that anyone who's buying European securities in the 10-year area uh, for five or 10 basis points should really be asking themselves some serious questions. Because what you're really implicitly saying is the Eurozone is going to blow up. And this is the Armageddon trade. And then I would ask you, OK, let's assume that's correct. When are you going to liquidate that portfolio? Because most investors who will take sort of that precautionary view are not in a position to actually trade out. Trader types who are in the market every day can trade around these kind of positions. But if you look at the, the decimation that can happen to you if your portfolio, let's say you buy it at 10 basis points and rates double to 20 basis points, it takes like, I don't know, 30 years or whatever to recoup the loss in principle. So I would stay away unless you're in some one of these risk parity trades where you, you, I'm sure you've heard of these trades where you have uh, the four quadrants and the, and, and the different uh, and the levered positions. But absent that, I would be very careful about owning European securities at extremely low rates or, or negative rates. The other market I would think about carefully is Japan. Japan has uh, embarked on a c classic reflation policy. And even though the yen might actually strengthen short term, I think uh, they're bent upon reinvigorating or reviving or revitalizing the economy. So they're going to really continue to press the, uh, the pedal. So I think the, the stock market is at a 15-year high. I get it. Um, there can be a pullback. But longer term, I think um, you know, the, the, yen, the, the, the yen markets, the Japanese equity markets, will do well. And, and shorter term, I think um, oil and gas uh, has been torched. But I think as a, as a short-term trade, I think that does better. But overall, we're constructive on the emerging markets, but we're very selective. And we believe that this is the kind of environment that you have to pick countries and pick strategies, as opposed to saying, I'm uh, investing across the, just across the board. OK, we'll come and dig into the specific strategies in, in, a, in a few minutes. But um, Juan Sartori, a founder and chief uh, executive chairman of uh, Union Group based out of Uruguay. Um, I mean, Latin America seems to also, as a, as a overall economy have uh, you know, hit some serious problems. I, I remember a few years ago we had an economist cover celebrating the takeoff of Brazil, which we illustrated with the, the statue of Jesus sort of flying up into the atmosphere. And then a couple of years later, we, we had one where it goes into a horrible tailspin. Um, and it seems like you know, things just keep getting worse in Brazil. Um, Venezuela looks like it's going to get worse. Um, 
before it gets better. Uh, Argentina, you know, we've given up thinking whether it can get ever going to turn around there. It just feels, as, as a macro story, the big economy is doing quite badly. And even Mexico, which, you know, is a relatively strong story, there's still a lot of, you know, sort of sense of how fast are things really going to improve there. How, how bad does it look from from Uruguay, and uh, are, you, uh, uh, are you as gloomy as I sound? No, well, l l last year, <laughs> the economy selected Uruguay as the best country in the world, That's remember? true. So I think that's a very bad sign for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but be beyond that, you have today, in Latin America, you can put it in three very different buckets. The, what we call the giants, Brazil and Mexico, slow growth, uh, structural issues, I mean, a, a lot of corruption scandals, leadership credibility problems that are making that investor flows are not coming there. And as they are never really high growth economies, investor flows, like, like, market, like Mark was, was saying, determine over and under valuations over cycles. So it's cheap today with big problems. When investors come back, I think it's going to pick up quite quickly. But it's not a place that today is very attractive from a fundamental point of view. On the other side, on the smaller countries, you have the, the dark side. Venezuela, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador. I mean, we expect uh, Venezuela to probably default in the next uh, year. Uh, civil war, any situation is possible. Venezuela, talking about the worst. Argentina has elections in uh, one year, uh, October of this year. I don't think it's going to change much to a, a complicated country that uh, has historically disappointed investors. The Bolivia and Ecuador has have long-term leadership there with, with significant issues. So. We don't expect that to improve in the short term, and I don't think it's part of anybody's investable universe because of the high political risk. <laughs> However, there's a whole part of Latin America that is the, the Pacific countries, Colombia, Peru, Chile, and I would add to that Uruguay and Paraguay, who have found their place in the, in the world economy. They have all reached investment grade, so in addition to a very high growth of average of 7% over the last 10 years, that has really reprised and generated huge GDP increases, there's been an important factor that we always forget that is a reduction in the risk of investing in these countries. It's particularly important in investing in, in infrastructure, for example. If we assume uh, credit ratings and an investment grade is the best way of comparing political or investment risk, we have now better risk in this part of Latin America than in many countries of developed Europe, for example. And the trend <coughs> is definitely in the favor for these countries. They are receiving more and more investor flows. The growth is there. The valuations are attractive. So it's a place that we believe we were asking over five years. We think these countries will continue growing, maybe not 7 8%, but 3 4% with a lower uh, level of risk. We expect over the next five years the, the dark side to collapse by its own uh, weight. Uh, that would create an opportunity. We are sure about it. We are looking at it, but it's a longer-term one. The recovery of these large economies of Venezuela, of Argentina, that eventually have a lot of wealth to be created in there. And then the, the developed countries, uh, Brazil, Mexico, more driven by investment flows. Uh, the BRICS, you know, this, this way of just focusing on a, on a single emerging market trade and saying Brazil is the same as Russia, the same uh, than India. I think it's finished for the next five years. And I totally agree that it's going to be more picking and going into the details of each economies. But definitely, if you pick the right place of each of these continents, higher growth and higher returns expected than what we are seeing over five years in developed economies. And how do you feel about Cuba? <laughs> but, uh, I, I love to, I was there uh, mm -hmm. uh, less than a month ago. Yeah. Mm. For partying. And, uh, for partying. For <laughs> but but the, the, op the opportunity there is that the US is going to lift the embargo. Uh, it's going to come back into the international community, no doubt about it. But how is the internal system going to change? Uh, when I was there, you go to the hotel, to the restaurant, to the fuel station, everything's government owned. So there's no real way of playing it if the internal political system doesn't change, not, uh, doesn't allow for private ownership. <laughs> so a good place for holidays for the next five years, but I don't see big, big uh, changes internally there. Great. Well, let's, let's switch to Africa. Um, yeah, I think back in 2000, The Economist ran a cover, The Hopeless Continent, which uh, got us a lot of criticism, but I think did capture the mood in Africa or the, the world's feeling about Africa at the time. And then in 2011, we ran a, a different cover called Africa Rising, which I think was a very optimistic view of, of Africa as, as maybe on the threshold of, of the sort of dramatic uh, modernization and integration into the world economy that maybe many other emerging markets had experienced before. And 
since 2011, I think we've become, again, a little, <laughs> the, the, the story's become more nuanced again. It feels South Africa seems to be wobbling a bit in uh, sorts of ways. We've got the resurgence of violence. And we have Nigeria, the uh, huge economy that, that seemed at times to be about to really power forward. Um, now, um, you know, a new government in place, um, but still lots of terrorist risk. And then this general problem of the oil price having fallen. Um, you see Shell and others today saying they're cutting back on their investment there. Um, so Brian, um, ABC, Brian, uh, Brian Orijako, the chairman of, of, of Seplat Petroleum. I, had, I mean, you've, you've been in this industry, you've been in Nigeria as an oil guy for a long time. How does it feel to you, Africa rising? If so, how strongly is it rising? And how much of the short-term uh, outlook you know, clouding your, the story? Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I think... Matthew. The, oh, Matthew. Sorry. My colleagues, Jonathan, fact, you talked to the other day. I was just day. going to say my, <laughs> my, my tale of two economists, mm. journalists. I was with Jonathan over the weekend, and now I'm with Matthew, both of the economist uh, newspapers. Basically, I think the Africa hopeless continent and Africa rising is very apt in describing what is going on at the moment. I think the Africa rising is obviously well positioned. It basically places Africa as the right destination for investment today, and the reasons are bound for this to happen. Obviously, the reasons why he talked about the hopeless continent about 10 years ago, indeed about 15 years ago, have all changed. We're beginning to ch see changes in the landscape politically in that sense. And you mentioned Nigeria, the election recently, and the outcome is an eloquent testimony that things are changing. At the time he spoke about the hopeless continent, there were just about three really free uh, uh, democracies in Africa. There were stories of wars, stories of corruptions increasing. And today, many of those things are changing. We're beginning to see quite a lot of things change in Africa. Better uh, economies are emerging. The population is young, strong workforce very strong entrepreneurial spirit. A lot of the countries are beginning to show real genuine reforms that are really transforming the continent. Eight out of 10 of the grow fastest growing economies are in Africa. And obviously, these are speaking volumes about things that are happening. Now, with respect to Africa rising, I think the way to look at that is you are now beginning to see a lot of people embracing the change. But that does not mean that things have really come to where we want it to be. What it means is all those good things need to be consolidated and built upon. And then those who are not changing should begin to change. Now, I take it from where um, uh, Mark spoke when he said, investment in Africa, they are very constructive and selective. That is quite true. I think what is happening is all those countries that have taken the right step, especially with respect to transforming the government, making sure that the issues that are talked about in Africa, corruption, are being addressed, and very positively so, not just by saying it, but basically palpably doing things about it. That would create real, the right political will to do things. We're beginning to see Africa countries really embracing real reforms. Nigeria, for example, the gas reform is a huge catalyst for growth and investment. The, the pension reform in Nigeria has actually occasioned quite a lot of availability of capital within the country and indeed Africa. Now, the next way to look at it is look at the corporate entities. Because obviously there are various, uh, several billions of investable capital that are really looking for where you have headroom for growth. And obviously Africa is a great uh, uh, entity for that to happen. But you have to create the right environment. And this is where the government comes into play. They need to really embrace the right political will to begin to address issues of corruption, subsidy, and putting in place those environmental factors that will let the investment flow. At the corporate level, the real message to give is once you have a company that is properly governed, strong corporate governance, good, diverse, and experienced board, very professional and experienced management team, those are the things that are required. And then, of course, you take it to the next level. They need to bring themselves to the level where investors can see it and capital to flow. And, and basically, I like to give the, the Seplat example, and obviously so. In 2014, we, we really took the bold step of listing the company in the, in the London Stock Exchange as well as 
the Nigeria Stock Exchange. Mark did not invest, but obviously he made a very strong case about strong corporate governance. And I must say that having put ourselves to that level of scrutiny, we did see quite a lot of investment flow. Indeed, we set out initially to raise $250 million. We reset that to $500 million. That IPO was oversubscribed, and we raised $500 million, all because the, 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 the entity for investment being at the corporate level was right. But one of the messages that came was the fact that there are quite a lot of capitals looking for homes, and you need to position yourself to receive those. That, that's really the, the lesson for us to learn there. So going forward, Africa remains a very strong entity for investment. I hear when you one spoke about the BRICS, that obviously has given way to, to, to the mint economies and Nigeria being one of them. One of the challenges that still remain today is the fact that in Nigeria, economy has been rebased, biggest in Africa, there are still challenges. But the good news is those challenges, for everyone you see, there are at least two or three opportunities for growth. I, I think I'll, I'll stop so far. So Jay Ireland, I mean, GE has uh, probably of all the big global powerhouse companies that come out of America has, has really pinned its colors to the mast of emerging markets, not least by taking senior executives such as yourself and moving you to Africa and where you're now president of GE Africa. Um, you know, how has how the, the sort of last couple of years of um, Sort of growing concerns about how the more nuanced story about the emerging markets. How's that affected your thinking, and particularly, I guess, the the oil um, and gas story, which obviously is a big part mm -hmm. of GE's outlook, and you know, the fact that the price has fallen so far. How's how's that affecting your thinking sure. on the long term? Play couple couple things and comments from uh, what we've heard so far. I think you know one kind of brought up a good point, and that's you know the the old way of of investing in developing markets was the BRICS. And the brick, you know, when, you, when you're sitting in Africa or Latin America, as Juan described it, you know, I don't think of China and India, Brazil and Russia as necessarily developing versus what we're, we're sitting. Now, I know that we're the frontier markets. But I think from an investor standpoint, that was the easy way to do it. You had four big countries that you could follow pretty well. Now they've got their issues, as you hear, and, and now the next level is you got to know about 100 countries. you got to know about the next tier, as Juan said, in Latin America. you got to know about, you know, different ways to invest in, in Africa, et cetera. I think so that's, that's one thing that's changed dramatically. Two is what Mark t talked about was public or private. Uh, he he kind of went through pretty well on the public side. I think the private side, and that gets to answer your question, which is the way we look at it, which is investing our capital from the standpoint of where we think growth will be. We're in you know, 140 countries around the world. Uh, we put a big focus on, on, emerging, mar on, on emerging regions, and, and in that are different countries. And <clears throat> if you look at the underlying growth of these countries, as Brian said, in Nigeria, tremendous change just occurred a, few or a month or so ago. And we're going to see changes there. We're starting to see it broader across the continent as well. And I think that's where you've got to think. So when we think about going into a country, uh, we look at it in a few different ways. One is, obviously, what's the economic potential from the standpoint of what we sell? Um, uh, and is, is the country big enough, et cetera? But you look at the rule of law, the corruption, the, the, the ability of uh, one of the things that I think has gone unnoticed is that <clears throat> through the elections that have, <clears throat> that have occurred since the beginning of the, of the century here of 2000, is that you're seeing, as from a business perspective, changes in the leadership. Sometimes parties change, and sometimes just the leaders change. But most importantly, the business community doesn't get impacted. The new guys don't come in and throw out all the contracts from the last administration. That's a huge, huge aspect from, from the standpoint of confidence. Uh, so I think that's, so those are, those are some, some things we look at. And then obviously where, where we feel that what we will do uh, will get recognized and, you know, and focused. And so we're, we're focused pretty much on, I'd say, 12, about 10 to 12 countries in Africa. Um, <clears throat> and we look at it from a standpoint of, of obviously, uh, we, we invest there. We invest in facilities. We have assembly facilities now in, in Nigeria, um, in uh, Angola, South Africa. We'll soon be putting some in Ethiopia service facilities in Ghana, and Mozambique will be a new one as well, and, and Kenya. So, 
So those are kind of where we really focus. And then we look at what the underlying infrastructure is, not the physical infrastructure, which is key, but most importantly, the skills, the skills building and capacity building infrastructure. Are there good universities to draw uh, people for employment? But do they focus not just on, you know, one of the things we do find in Africa is that the, the schools, depending on the colonial, whoever had, them, had the countries colonially, how they um, invested in education, but we get a lot of business, marketing, you know, general capability, not a lot of technical. And so we've been in a lot of in investment in technical training, curriculum development, and things like that. And then obviously taking a look at the ease of doing business in a country uh, from the standpoint of work permits and, and being able to move people in and out, travel, et cetera. So all of those. And so on the underlying piece of that is you're seeing an economy that uh, on the whole is growing, as, as Brian said, eight of 10 fastest, et cetera. But what we're seeing is depending on the, the impact of oil, back to your second part of the question, uh, you know, Kenya, as an example, where I live, is, doesn't have any oil. Or they have some, they've just found some, but haven't really done anything with it yet. Uh, so it's a positive. Now, it's, now they have an issue on the terrorism front and tourism, et cetera. Um, Nigeria, obviously, uh, the oil price was a shock. Angola as well. I think it did a wake-up call a little bit for Nigeria. And, and we were, Brian and I were talking, from 1980 to 1996, the average price of a barrel of oil was $20. Went down to 10. Uh, from 96 to 2006, roughly 50, which is where we're at today, spiked to 100 for four years. So everybody, oh, the oil, it's been, we've been operating on $50 oil for a long, long time. And that used to be a good price. And it's just the perception of what, what, you know, what, what has happened in the last four years and how countries and companies have, have reacted to it. So I think the aspect is to, to really focus in on Nigeria. Yes, they're, you know, the budget's got to be cut. They're going to cut back on capital spending. But there's 150 million people that you know, wake up every morning and they want more goods and services. They want more infrastructure. There, there's a, and you know, it's becoming, the issue with Nigeria isn't the percentage of, of oil versus the GDP, it's the, it's the percentage of oil revenues that were into the Nigerian budget. So, and when I was visited with you in, in uh, Lagos or in Buja last year, I mean, there were these three themes that you were talking about. One was the oil sector, one was the general modernization of the power sector, <coughs> yep. and then the third was the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. And I mean, have you reweighted your investments for the next five years in those across those three? Sectors? Well, those those facilities that we're still investing, we're, we're putting a, a subsea oil and gas equipment uh, facility in in Calabar, Nigeria. We're continuing to do that. We're doing the same thing in Angola. These these are you know we've been around a long time as a company. You see cycles. If you stop investing at the bottoms of cycles, you'll never get it at right at the top. And you've got to continue to, to invest your capital because the long-term view is, you know, we're going to be in Nigeria for, we've been in Nigeria for a long time, we're going to be in Nigeria for a long time. We've got to continue to invest. Now, it's our job on the ground to take that facility. And if we don't have the oil and gas equipment that can fill it, we go look for other things. There's no, you know, we can do a lot more uh, on the continent from a standpoint of our power and water business, uh, from a standpoint of servicing and healthcare, A lot of stuff gets shipped out. We can start doing a lot of things internally. So there's a lot of things that you can do, and I think it's up to the companies such as ours to adjust and, and work that way. But I think the, 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 gener the general investment, you still have to, you, you have to, hi you still have to hire good people. You can't, s everybody, we do the same thing. I, it's one of my real bugaboos. We put in hiring freezes. And you sit there and you go, well, now you, you basically eliminate it. What you should be doing is readjusting your workforce, not, not freezing it. Because the workforce you have now is all of a sudden there's a lot more people out there that might not have been, that are good, that might be wanting to change some thoughts about what they want to do. This is the time to be hiring yes. and, and readjusting and dealing with, you know, the people that you don't need in your workforce. So I think that's the balance that you've got to think long-term investing. And then one, one other question for G, and then we'll, we'll move on. But, I mean, the... How does China look, look for you at the moment in the next five years? 
Well, from which perspective? It's sitting in Africa watching them come in? Or no, no, we're actual, sitting in, the actual, sitting in the actual, China? Right, and, the yeah. actual business in China. Okay. Yeah. Um, the actual business in China, I, I think you're starting to see a, a dynamic. Um, they're continuing to invest in higher tech um, in, in our, our arenas, you know, healthcare, aviation, local transportation, et cetera. And, um, and so we're going to continue to see that. So we're seeing, uh, I think, the big infrastructure boom that occurred, you know, building 100 airports and rail lines and all that have, have stopped. And what I, my thesis is, quite frankly, what we're seeing now is the state-owned enterprises are still being re, readjusted, if you will, and recalibrated. And they're now, as domestic growth slows a little bit, uh, are looking at Africa as the next real growth area for their state-owned enterprises for products. You know, just this week, you know, they announced China uh, Bridge and Rail just announced, I think, five billion dollars of deals in in building uh, rail 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 lines across three African countries. So that's going to continue. This is their new growth area, and and I think that the dynamic is is you know, from our perspective, is so we view them as a competitor, as a partner as a customer, you know, it's one of those multi-headed um, relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, but the growth there is is still strong, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll to see, it'll be on, it's at a different yeah. scale. So Mark, I just wanted to pick up on, uh, move on to look at the, how, how, how we should be thinking about this big commodity cycle and oil and gas within it, because obviously as you look across the emerging markets. I mean, that is a huge differentiator. What view you take on? You know, is the commodity boom really over? Is is the oil price going to settle at around what it is now, or come up, or drop further? What what's your thinking? So over long periods of time, you've exhibited a decline in the uh, real the real price for commodities, uh, and we know that as you know for, from history. So you, but in this decline, you always get these periodic booms. Mm. And I, you know, and I think as an investor, at some point you have to decide: Are you prepared to play those booms? Are you prepared to try to, you know, for instance, if you look at what's happening in, oil, in the oil and gas space in general today, a lot of securities have have essentially been regurgitated because institutional investors have sold them willy-nilly, and you're able to acquire quality assets through the debt. And, you know, at the very interesting prices. And that's because people have said, out, you know, just sell. In Africa, you have the same thing. You have companies that have had uh, tremendous financial strain. So you're, you know, you should be looking at these opportunities today because it's not like the price of oil is suddenly going to drop to 20. What's fascinating about this business... You might have said that when it was at 100. It's not yeah. going to suddenly drop to 50. Why, why is it not going to drop to 20? It, well... It can do anything it wants to, but the question is, at 20 or at 30 or at 40, you know, countries like uh, India that import a lot of oil, uh, you know, it still is the engine for economic growth. So I, I don't see oil really staying at, if it drops to 20, I don't think it will drop to 20. We think it may go to 40 or 45, but ultimately it's going to probably be in a band of 55 to 75. But the, what's interesting and fascinating about our business is whether it's people getting hyped about Brazil or oil, you go through these phases where people get just super hyped. So they talk about Brazil and it's the next, you know, amazing thing. And then we turn around and they say, oh, no, we, we, you know, we got to get out of Brazil because, you know, they've discovered this thing. It's the same thing with oil and gas. How many people told us that oil was, what, what did they call it, peak oil? And we had all these uh, analysts who were talking about $200 oil and, you know, and now you have this hue and cry, which is, oh, now we're going to 20. So no. That's not the case. But do you feel you have to look at emerging economies? You have to look at, you separate out the commodity dependent ones from, yes. the, from the others? Absolutely, because then it's ultimately a question of governance too, because countries mm -hmm. that are dependent on commodities, if the governance is not in place, then you're dealing with a different set of factors. And, and I think this is what uh, Jay was alluding to, that you know, Kenya doesn't have, doesn't have a lot of resources, but it has kind of institutional mindset to do things, and they've become a leader in IT and the digital space. I mean, if you think about banking, Africa is redefining banking, right? I mean, if you look at how much is going through this M-Pesa, 
through their mobile payment system, I think the numbers are staggering. It's like uh, every three months, I think it's the size of the GDP. So there are some amazing things happening in countries right. that don't have resources. There's 61 million, there's 61 million mm -hmm. mobile money users right now in Africa. And these aren't all of the high-end people. These are all the way down into villagers, et cetera. And I think that's a key. We had a long discussion yesterday in a session about it. And that, that um, innovation is really driving a lot, of, a lot of potential growth from that standpoint. And, you know, I, would, I don't know what th – there isn't any mobile money to speak of here. And so that, that's, a, I think, a tremendous uh, leapfrog, as, as Marcus said. Brian, you wanted to come yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just speaking about the, the oil price and, and the real impact in Africa, I think for me the low oil price that virtually collapses is a wake-up call for Africa. It is the time to begin to tap other opportunities in Africa. It is the time for diversification of the economy. It is the time to begin to balance the budget <coughs> not from oil but from other things. It is the time to, to remove subsidies. It is the time for Africa and particularly Nigeria to be thinking about export of products, not crude oil. It is the time to really see Africa as the real frontier for demand. Because if you look at the oil price, the, 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 the supply and demand fundamentals, the real culprit is not the oversupply of, of crude oil that has been orchestrated by shale oil and gas, but it's indeed the declining demand, especially with, with, with the, the, the contraction in Asia. So what Africa should do is to now create that new frontier for demand, uh, and, and the opportunities are there. When you look at oil and gas per se, some of the countries, and again, I, I talk about Nigeria, and Jay mentioned it a while ago, what is happening is when the oil prices are down, people cut back on investments, but indeed, this is the time to invest. And those cutbacks on investment are the things that will now translate to the cyclical nature of the oil price, and then you begin to see rebound, and as we're seeing now. But for, for us in, in Nigeria, what we're really holding on to is the aspect of diversification. And at the heart of this diversification is the reform that the government has done. And we've always said that gas is indeed the, the life wire of that transformation. In Nigeria, the gas reform has brought about the gas to power and the privatization. And obviously, GE is doing quite a lot in Nigeria there. Gas to agriculture, obviously, the population is there. There are quite a lot of mouths to be fed. So fertilizer is, is a key thing. Unemployment is key. So gas to industry is very, very important. So I think going forward, the opportunities remain there. And the entities and the environment poli politically will definitely need to be addressed. To so Juan, I, 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 Warren Buffett likes to say that when the tide goes out, you can see who's swimming naked. And you know, Brazil and the oil price, I think, is, a, is a, maybe a sort of classic illustration that he's right, you know, it's revealed tremendous political problems within the country. Do you see any silver linings in Brazil? And on the other hand, you know, if you look at a country like Chile, how is that, despite its dependence on the commodity cycle, how has it been able to remain one of your stars that you're being optimistic about? Hey, we, we have, a, as, a, as a company, a different view. Mm. We believe Latin America is a commodity producer will always be a commodity producer, and it's the only chance of being the best in the world at something. I don't think we can evolve into a technology uh, society in the very short term or in the medium term. So what we focus on is countries that have a competitive advantage in producing something. Uh, of course, Brazil's oil production, uh, 3,000 meters under the water, 2,000 meters under the salt, has a cost of production that is not the most attractive uh, for, for them. So that's going to be very challenging. However, Brazil is the biggest and most efficient producer of soybean, of uh, beef, of a lot of, other, of iron ore, of a lot of other commodities that, regardless of the price, is going to give them an advantage over other zones in the world. Um, Chile is uh, maybe the only example that has been able to diversify slightly its economy, but mainly by providing more added value to commodities. You know, they produce uh, wine, uh, blueberries instead of pure soybeans or wheat, something that is a bit more advanced in terms of the, of the added value. So oil is something similar. I give you an example as a, as a firm. Uh, Uruguay is one of the biggest exporters of food in the world. Uh, we've been buying uh, land in Uruguay at prices 10 times cheaper than you can buy, buy land here in the, in the United States. We deployed almost a billion dollars in farmland in Uruguay. Today we are one of the most efficient exporters of rice, soybean, beef in the world as a, as a company. We are uh, talking about oil. Oil is down to $50. I think that's going to bring also a lag on the reduction of cost of production. Yeah. Then the last three years was had exploded beyond any reason. 
cost of production comes back to an average historical rate, $50 is a good price. So we, we closed, uh, it was announced yesterday, one of the biggest um, uh, oil exploration blocks in Peru. The valuation six months ago was $200 million. We bought it for $17 million yesterday. Is that reflective of really the fact that oil is never going to come back and it's never even going to be a profitable business of producing oil there? I don't think so. So currently the opportunity is a mix of determining in Latin America which continent or which country has a competitive advantage on something, agriculture in Uruguay, maybe copper in Chile, maybe lithium, I was talking this morning in Bolivia, that you need for all the, the technology, and then making sure you are buying it at a very low price. And when do we make good, uh, good price in Latin America? When foreign investors suddenly flow out and get a big scare, like it's happened now in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, Brazil, the currency is down 50%, the market is down 30 40%. So you're buying something 70% below the price that it was one or two years ago. Now, we don't think so Brazil... So you think that looks like a good price now, Brazil? Does it, does it? I, think, I think it's a good price. I'm not sure it's the right timing with a catalyst. Mm. But over five years, I'm sure yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting... Yeah. interesting so what moment. will be the key for you timing-wise with Brazil? What will be the turning point? I think Brazil has a, a credibility issue, and there we go back to, to leadership. You know, this, this president is not having all the, the capacity to really implement the reforms and clean up the credibility issue of, of Brazil. There's been a lot of cases of very successful companies that went uh, uh, bankrupt with a lot of foreign investors there. So investors need a period to, to rest and, and trust Brazil again and Brazilian entrepreneurs, Brazilian companies. So it's really building credibility again, more than any fundamental economic change that we could see in, in, in those countries. Definitely an increase of the prices of the commodities that Brazil sells is going to resume growth in, in that country. We think, I mean, our view is over the next two to three years, uh, agricultural commodities are at 10 year low, uh, oil the same. Uh, there's been an absolute increase in, in population, in demand, in a lot of factors that, uh, that we believe will bring prices back to a more historical average than they are today. Okay, we'll go to questions in a moment. I just want to ask one more question around you know, if you're investing as an American, or do you, do you invest in the public market? Do you, in, do you try and do <laughs> private market investments? Do you partner with a local company? Or are you better off investing in a, a GE or another American Well, definitely firm investing obviously in GE. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the obvious answer. Yeah, right. But Mark, what, what, would you, what would you, what's your advice So the that? question, again, is, is, you know, is, is nuanced. Because in order to invest in the private markets, you need to have some experience. And it's easy to say, oh, I'm going to invest in a PE fund because historically that's an extra 500 basis points. Therefore, if the long-term returns for equity are seven, I add five, I get 12. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to get 12. You, know, you need to be in the top quartile. You need to know how to pick managers. That's a complex strategy. So ultimately, each organization has to be honest with itself and ask itself the, the, uh, the seminal question, what am I good at doing? Can I pick managers? Can I pick, you know, illiquid strategies? Am I able to survive with illiquid strategies? Because we went through this brutal period in 2008, 2009, and you had many institutions that were not able to fund their private equity capital commitments. So that's a tough, that's a tough call. It, ultimately, if you're not sure, you're better, sta you're, you're better off staying in the private markets. And then, and I use the word dabbling carefully, and then experimenting a little bit using your organization to learn how to invest in private markets. Because the so liquidity- staying in the public markets, but yes, a little bit of- Yes, a little bit, just yeah. to learn. But you can't just deploy large amounts of capital in, in private markets and then say, oh, I'm going to do much better. You can get into trouble. But let's say you are a, a, you know, a seasoned private investor, you'd be better off there, would you? Yes, absolutely. Now, today, what's fascinating about what's happening today, given that interest rates have been suppressed, you have a strange phenomenon where you're not getting as much as before for illiquidity premium. So today, you can paradoxically, you might say, in Brazil, to one's point, in Brazil, you're better off being in the equity market. By the way, the, the companies in Brazil, let's put aside Petrobras, which had... Uh, which was run by the state and had a lot of heavy state interference. Private companies in Brazil actually have high levels of governance. So you can make a case that, yes, I'm going to make an investment over the next five years in Brazil. I'm going to go with, with uh, private companies. And I don't necessarily have to buy Vale or Petrobras. I can just buy 
I can, I can and just buy the companies that service Brazil. I mean, this is a huge economy, right? And it's not just, I mean, oil is sort of icing on the cake for Brazil. They have minerals, they have sunlight, they have water, they have land. I mean, Brazil is an amazing story. You've just had very bad governance in the country. Good football, good music. Good samba. <laughs> good. You, I mean, you obviously are, are going to echo the view that private is, is the better strategy. Are you? But within yeah, but that, where, where are you focused? Is land the best way? In but I agree that we've been in a, in a strange situation mm -hmm. where people suddenly are so afraid of the volatility and the mark to market of some things that they almost prefer to invest prefer to invest in a private company even though it's a higher valuation it's a premium to illiquidity yeah. opposite always we we always learn yeah. so it's a situation of if you have a 5 to 7 year view i rather have the mark to market not involved in my investment decisions because mm. we've made bad decisions precisely by going out at the wrong time getting yeah. scared in the wrong time so we see a trend uh, our investors are mainly pension funds insurance companies family offices so when you have a long term investment horizon Liquidity in the middle is almost perceived as a risk instead of an opportunity. So, so there's moments to, to watch those relative valuations, private and, and public, a bit more. So Brian, if we wanted to invest in Nigeria at the moment, best, best strategy? Best strategy is the private, private space uh, for obvious reasons. The main message is good governance and discipline. I, I, I spoke about it earlier on, obviously because of not very high confidence in the past. All of those have changed. When I spoke about CEPLAT, one of the things we've done and prided ourselves about is the strong corporate governance and discipline. So that's a public we, space for yourself, though, right? Well, Not private. Well, it, well, we started from private and then went public. Yeah. But what part of the things you do is when you invest in the private and then make that a stimulus to now go private, yeah. to further uh, to consolidate get and, get, and get public okay. and then bring uh, more investments in, into that space. That, that's the way to look at it. But of course, I, I, told, I spoke very strongly about the governance and, and, and the discipline. Mm. When we did the IPO, one of the things that happened and one of the things we told the market was that we're going to acquire assets. But then what then happened, and this is where we really manifested discipline, we then participated in some bids with Shell, and, and we felt that the prices were not right and we didn't invest. Recently, again, we, we had an opportunity to acquire a company that was really on its knees. We looked at the fundamentals, we felt it was not right. Discipline again, we cut back. So I think the, the, the thing to drive it, as I said, is, is governance and, and discipline. And Jay, I, I mean, a lot of your exposure is to, to the infrastructure story. Mm -hmm. That's your bet. And I mean, infrastructure historically has just been dogged with political risk um, of all sorts, um, particularly in emerging markets. I mean, how, how do you feel? currently about the political risks and how you manage that as a Well, I, I think if you think about risk, you've got a, no, a number of risks when you go, I'll, I'm assuming you're talking about project financing and project investing. But just, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you've got, obviously one is a security issue, which, which depending on the country and stuff, so that's one risk. The other one is political risk. You know, part of it is is the, the rule of law and, and how you get contracts done, all that kind of stuff, but it's also whether the political party will stay there and, and will honor subsequent, uh, administ or subsequent administrations will honor it. And then you've got the typical credit um, risk, et cetera. And one of the key things, which I think is one of the things we're trying to work on, Mark and I have been discussing it, is you've got a timing risk. And this is where I would say naive investors come in and think that you know they're going to put some money to work, uh, but the problem is getting projects developed over a period of time ties up your capital for quite a while before you get a return. So there's a timing risk tied into it as well. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do with at least the stuff that we're in is trying to shrink that, shrink that timing. So the typical power project right now takes anywhere from five to seven years to go from development to getting power on the grid. And and three to five years of that is fundamentally, you know, negotiations and underwriting and all of that. It's not the building of the facility. That app actually is some of the easier stuff. So I think if we can shrink that down by having, you know, an understanding of, of more standardized things from both sides and underwriting capability platforms uh, that you can bring financing tied into, I think there's a lot. And that'll really, in my opinion, catalyze a lot of the investment because of the power, power, it, it, take that as the infrastructure piece for a second. 
that's going to continue to drive economic growth, and I think that's the key thing. So, you know, it's one of those. Is there a model there for that, or is that still being developed? We're, we're working it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't say there is right now. We're, we're trying to work it, um, but it's, it's a difficult one because you've got to work a number of different players, and I think the, the point is, to, to your, one of the key points you made is, is it's a long-term investment, and over that time horizon, am I willing to invest in country X or project Y for the next 10 years? Because most of the money right now, the longest tenor that you can get is maybe seven years. And so you're, you know, it's not the best, the best use of, uh, or it's not the best capital for a long-term asset like a utility, which is fundamentally, or a railroad or whatever. So I think we're working that, and it's, it's, it'll take some creative people, and I think the first people in, and, you know, Cote d'Ivoire had a, they, they've fundamentally run uh, their power uh, grid on independent power producers. And through the two years that they had a little bit or a year and a half of like a civil war, the power never went out, they never didn't pay, and they continued throughout the whole time frame. So when you, when you have an infrastructure that's critical to the economy's performance, you will, you typically get paid, and, and so that's why I think a little bit of the view of what the risk is is probably perception is greater than reality. Okay, well, let's take two or three <laughs> questions from the, the audience. Someone right at the front here. Just please say who you are, and uh, maybe we'll take two or three, and then we'll just come back to the panel. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Wesley Fogel speaking for myself. Uh, just, uh, I think you may have internalized this in, in your responses to the question about investing in growth, but just a little bit more specifically, if you can express where you would see the best, for an investor, the best risk-adjusted return on investor capital e effectively. So adjusting for political risk or... or you mean country risk. specifically? Well, or I was going to say you could, you could go country, uh, you could choose a country or you could choose a sector, you could choose an asset class without being really specific, but just if, as you look at the, the, the areas that you focus on today. Great, and then we have someone at the front over on the left-hand side. Do we have a third person anywhere in the audience? Great, the lady in the middle, and then we'll go. Yeah, I also want to try to get a quick re uh, response from well. uh, uh, Keith Carson from California. Mm -hmm. uh, realizing actual profits, most of you are in, in, in countries that are very volatile, but actually realizing profits after such investment as a result of having maybe corruption in government, actually being paid for the work you're doing. If you can just kind of quickly summarize uh, the, the countries where it's more uh, challenging than not. Right, there's a lady in the middle. You're going to test people's ability to remember yeah. all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Georgina Baker from IFC. I wanted to pick up on what Jay was talking about in terms of infrastructure investing and project finance. Um, the, the needs for emerging market infrastructure are huge. There have been uh, large projects announced in both Colombia and uh, Mexico, which can't possibly be met through public financing. Um, so what is needed to bring institutional investors into this space? So the pickup of uh, on project finance in OECD countries is now quite significant if you go into, uh, into emerging markets. But the, the institutional investors, particularly the insurance companies, aren't, aren't so seem to be interested in, in, in working in emerging markets infrastructure. So I wanted to ask the panel their views on, on how to make this happen. Well, why don't we take that question first? If we put chart five up on the, on, on the uh, screen as well, that would be helpful, which shows the sort of huge increase in infrastructure uh, needs. This is, uh, yeah, chart five, please. Um, so there's been a dramatic ex rise, and the question is, you know, what are we, you know, where are, uh, we've had Jay's answer. I mean, Mark, what do you think in terms of what needs yeah. to be done to get much more money going into infrastructure? Um, actually, I was thinking about the question from the gentleman in the, yeah. in the front row. So we'll come back to that in a second. Okay. Can we just so you want, how do you, infra the how infrastructure, do you, so when picking up on Jay's point about infrastructure and the challenges of, you know, we all know there's a huge opportunity um, to, to, and that and the massive infrastructure investment well, across the emerging markets ought to be happening if we're going to get them the kind of development and growth that is possible. So how do you catalyze that? And, and yeah, and it, but it's it. not happening at the moment. I don't think like the scale necessary, is it? Well, I mean, actually, if you step back for a moment, uh, th th this this country needs a huge investment in infrastructure. <laughs> right. So I would kind of turn that question around and say, what should happen here? You know, <laughs> given the level of interest rates, what we should be doing in the states is mount, you know, r borrowing money and mounting these huge programs to invest in infrastructure. I'm not but trying I mean, to... the misgovernment of the United States is another well, panel, I think. I'm not going to dodge your question. Can we try I and focus on the, the, the developing world? Let's look at the developing world. 
I mean, well, what's, going, what's going on in the emerging world? I mean, how do we get more, more money? I think it will happen with time. I don't think there's like a magic bullet. I think, you know, as people do, to, to Jay's point about, you know, that the Cote d'Ivoire, as long as they're paying off their debt, as people get more comfortable mm -hmm. with infrastructure and countries understand that they have to honor their obligations and they actually, you know, live that, live that reality, I think you will see more money coming in because it's easy for someone to say, I'm building a road, I see it. You know, I'm building a canal, I see it, as opposed to saying, oh, I'm going to buy Uber or I'm going to buy something else at mm -hmm. these valuations. So I think over time you will see, especially in this environment of low interest rates, more money going into, mm -hmm. into countries that respect rules. And yeah. do you, I mean, to pick out the gentleman at the front's comment, I mean, are you seeing an improvement in the ability to collect the money that you yes, you've absolutely, from much much more so. Mm -hmm. In general, you're seeing much better infrastructure projects today than you were seeing five years ago. I think, from an investment perspective, you know, the pricing of infrastructure investments in Africa is is very high. I mean, one one of your colleagues is high. One of, yeah. yeah, one of your colleagues said the IFC's performance has been equivalent with OECD as it as it is mm. uh, with the emerging market, specifically yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, and and a higher return. And so, you know, and I, I can tell you other, other ECAs have said the same thing because they're the ones in there typically early. Um, and part of it's a combination of a few things. You think it's some of these investments they view as risky, you know, they're backed by five different credit enhancements, sovereign guarantees. I mean, that's like, you know. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. no risk money. <laughs> it's because yeah. there's five, five ways million. to get insured about it. So, so, why, so why is the flow of money not faster? Well, I, you know, it's, I think, look, I think it's, it's, we still need a continual flow, and I think it's partly is, it's up to us to make projects available. We don't have enough pro credible project yeah. developers in Africa. We don't have enough EPCs that can do the work. No American EPC is really there, Black and Beach to a degree. Some of the other guys come in under the LNG, under the oil guys, but fundamentally it's Chinese, Turks, and Spaniards that are in Africa. So I think it's more building out the infrastructure. A lot of it's dealing with the governments and trying to get projects through. So I think it's there. It's, it's one of these just making sure that the understanding of what you're getting into and what the real risk is is, is, is tied into what the reality is. And I think that's... Brian, if, if I may just make a quick comment. I think I hear the issues about confidence, the issues of rule of law, but a very large component of that is also the perception. There's quite a lot of perception about what is really the case. Quite a lot of the investors have never really even been to Africa. They don't fully appreciate what it takes to do business in Africa. But if you look at that potential for real investable capital flow in, into Africa, you find that even when you have the right regulatory framework, you still have people not being hesitant to those investments. The key point to make is the, the, the headroom for, for growth is very strong. The next thing is the return on those investments. I take gas, for example. Five years ago, gas price in Nigeria used to be less than 50 cents per million square. Today, the gas price in Nigeria is indeed higher than Henry Hunt price. So you can imagine investing in gas infrastructure in Nigeria, your returns is much higher than what you would do if you did it in America. So I think it's a balancing between that confidence and the, the perception of what is thought about and what the real situation is. Okay, so what I want to now do, I mean, it's pretty, our time is pretty much up, so I wanted each of you to answer the question we had from the front, which is, you know, what, what is... We didn't answer it well enough at the I can try. Let what me is try. The, what is it? <laughs> I want your, your number one, your number one um, no, I, I, can, I think I can answer through an example that we are doing part of the, of the three, three questions. We, we're investing a lot in infrastructure in, in Latin America. What we are looking at from a very common sense point of view is, first, that the return is attractive for the risk that we are taking. So a lot of the, the countries are implementing uh, PPA programs, a certain price, and trying to build a, an incentive return to look at it. The second is I want to know that when we build it, the country is not going to steal it from you, because that has been the issue. You look at uh, Bolivia nationalized most of the power industry over the last five years. Venezuela nationalized the oil, the power, the agricultural industry. So it's a real risk that you need to trust. And it's not Argentina. There's a new government in six months coming and saying we are different. Is not going to be believed overnight. So it's a mix of a nice uh, return risk perspective 
with a lot of confidence but on the But is it infrastructure that you would invest in or? Infrastructure. Oh, but because so, that's your answer to his question. Yeah, for example, okay. we see today uh, okay. infrastructure as a fixed income proxy. Fixed income is negative or zero with a government risk. At the end, infrastructure can give you a similar government risk, but with a, a multiple of the return that you get it there. So we made, for example, in, in Peru, a, a very large investment in power generation. Peru uh, lacks the, the electricity coming into the grid, uh, issued a very good system of PPAs, 20-year uh, power purchase agreements on hydroelectric dams, uh, issued around $2 billion <laughs> of potential projects there that generate a return at today's interest rates of approximately 16% on the equity. So we raised around $1.6 billion, mainly from uh, North American pension funds, to deploy into these constructions, and most of the debt, uh, 15 to 17 years, came from multilaterals. So as an example where a country was able to implement a system that immediately attracted private capital that was interested by the return, uh, government or multilateral capital that believed in the story, and the country was able to sort out its infrastructure problem. So there's a win-win scenario that is easy to, to, to put in place and that works in practice. And I'll give the last so word to you, Mark. So I would say, right, today, the single biggest and most interesting opportunity is what GE is doing. They're selling their capital market businesses. Now, I don't know as an individual investor you can get involved in that, but we were talking about that before with, with Jay. So Jeff Immelt has decided he doesn't want to be hassled by the regulators. And he said, it, you know, he's selling businesses that are probably $500 billion of size. And these are businesses that have been around for a very long time. And Jay was saying some of them are 40 years old. You can't replicate these businesses no matter how much money you have. So subject to the price, this is going to be a phenomenal opportunity because he's selling for non-economic reasons. He's not selling because, oh, I'm at two times book and now I want to lob it out. He's selling because he wants to get out of these businesses. So in my mind, you know, some people will say, oh, you should invest in country X or opportunity Y. Buying these businesses with the right partners is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Great. Well, we've had, I think, a really wide ranging and stimulating conversation. Thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. Thanks, Matt.